Good morning, I'm Lee. Good morning, I'm Gemma. Welcome to Glebe Chapel's Sunday morning online service. If you're new here and this is your first time of watching, then a very warm welcome to you. Equally, if you've been watching since the beginning of the online services, it's great to have you watching again. So some things we've really got to look forward to this morning is that we've got a kids slot by Izzy Golden, a prayer slot by Rachel Golden, a sermon by Richard Harker, and we've got songs led by various members of the music team. So we've got lots to look forward to. Okay, over to the notices. Okay, so in depth, we've got a Bible study with Richard Harker, which will be in the afternoon at 4 p.m. and there should have been a link sent via an email. Well, normally on the first Sunday of the month, um, when we met together, we would celebrate the birthdays for that month. Um, we would take along a box of chocolates and hand them round to anybody who had a birthday in June. Well, obviously, we can't really do that right now. That's a real shame. I love chocolates. So, um, we thought we would light you a candle. So, if your birthday is in June, I've got three candles here. So, we'll just light those. And the other thing we would do would be um, the person on the piano would start playing and everyone would sing happy birthday. Well, again, we can't do that. And it's just the two of us. So we thought we would try to sing you happy birthday just ourselves, for which we apologise for. Beforehand. Sincere apologies for my voice in particular. <laughs> so um, here we go for anyone's birthday who's in June. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. So if your birthday's in June, now is your time to blow out your birthday candles. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Okay. So a few weeks ago, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, sent me what I thought was quite a funny message. And it spoke to me about the situation I feel I'm in with uh, the social distancing. And he sent this. He said, the buttons on my jeans have started social distancing from each other. That's certainly happening to me right now. And I'm trying to do something about it. But on a more serious note, let's pray and let's commit this service to God. Father, we thank you that even though we may be, even though we are in our homes, we, 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 you are with us and that you are able to speak to us. And we thank you for technology and we thank you that we can be gathered together through technology. And we pray for everything in this service that you will speak to our hearts and we will come away from this service knowing that we've met with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so before we carry on, I'm just going to read a couple of verses. They're from the Psalms, so it's Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7. It says, Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. I just thought it would be... A nice thing to just quickly focus our minds on as um, it cries out praise to God and although we can't meet together we can't chat ask everyone else how they're doing and be together the Lord is always with us and he is our strength and our protection and we can keep on putting our trust in him even during these times and I thought also it was a helpful reminder as um, during the service we hear songs and try and sing along with them. And it says, with my song, I praise him. So this morning, I hope through the songs and through the various slots in the sermon, we can find ways in our own homes to carry on praising the Lord. OK, so we hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Bye for now. Morning, everybody. Welcome to our kitchen again. Um, my name's Julia and this is Naomi. And today we have Lindy playing through the window, her clarinet, which is really joyful. She's standing under an umbrella because it's starting to rain today. Rejoice. But anyway, that's really nice. So would you join with us, please, in singing When I Was Lost? You know all the things I 
Hello everyone, uh, it's great to be joining you again today um, and my job this week is I have the great privilege of being able to share with you some very exciting and very good news. Uh, many of you will know that Rob and Vicky have been expecting a baby and it's my great joy to share with you all that baby George arrived on Tuesday uh, he was weighing a very impressive nine pounds and uh, mum and baby are doing very well. So let's welcome and celebrate George Isaac Wallace, our newest member to our family here. And I'm sure that you will join me in celebrating with Robert, with Vicky, with big sister Ella and of course proud grandparents Gordon and Jackie. I just have a few verses, a blessing actually, to read from Numbers. Uh, you can find it in Numbers chapter 6, uh, verses 24 to 26. So may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favour and give you his peace. So let's just commit and bring this family uh, in prayer and thanksgiving now. Father, we just want to celebrate uh, and praise and thank you for the safe arrival of baby George. Father, we are so full of joy um, at this wonderful news. We thank you um, for Rob and for Vicky. And we just pray for them now, Father, that you will be uh, giving them the strength they need and the encouragement that they need um, as they adapt to becoming a family of four. Uh, we pray for little Ella as well, as she gets used to this new role of being a big sister. And Father, we think too of Gordon and Jackie, who uh, must be so full of joy and excited, but also mixed feeling at this time, uh, which is difficult for grandparents who might not be able to uh, to see or to touch their grandchildren as they would normally. So Father, we just pray for them especially, that you will draw near to them, you encourage them too, um, and that you will uh, provide creative ways through technology and maybe other means uh, where they can uh, meet and engage with their grandchildren. So Father, we just once again thank you for this blessing of a baby boy. Uh, we just pray that you will be with this little family and draw near to them. Amen.
this morning we're going to read a story called The Lost Sheep, which is found in the New Testament in the Bible. And this is a story that Jesus told as a parable. Here is a farmer. He has a hundred sheep. He is counting them. Look, can you see 99 sheep he's counted on his calculator? One of his sheep is missing. Oh dear, where has it gone? Is it in the hen house? No. Is it behind the haystack? No. Is it under the hedge? No, it's lost. All day the farmer looks for his sheep. He climbs up hills and scrambles over rocks. He crawls through bramble bushes. The fawns scratch him, but he will not give up. He is tired and hungry. His feet ache, but he will not give up. At last, the farmer sees his sheep. It has fallen in the river. Oh dear. The farmer dives into the water. Splush! He rescues the sheep. Hooray! The farmer has found his sheep. Let's all have a party. <laughs> Jesus says, God is like the farmer. He loves us just like the farmer loves his sheep. The end. Jesus said, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. What do you do? You leave the other 99 sheep in the pasture and go looking for the one that got lost until you find it. When you find it, you're so happy that you put it on your shoulders and carry it back home. Then you call your friends and neighbours together and say to them, I'm so happy. I found my lost sheep. Let's celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Luke 15 verses 4 to 7. Hi, I'm Rach. I'm a member at Glebe Chapel. You'd usually find me at the baby and toddler group or in the kitchen helping to get meals ready. But somehow, a couple of weeks ago, I found myself offering to do a prayer slot. Just lately, I've started writing the names of people that I pray for onto pebbles. I find that holding the weight of the pebble in one hand and passing it across to the other once I've prayed for that person just reminds me that God wants us to give him the weight of our concerns, as well as thanking him for all the good stuff, of course. There's a verse in the Bible in 1 Peter that says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. And if you're still not sure whether God cares for you really, one of the Psalms says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. So we pray. Thank you, Father, that we can come to you through the name of Jesus. Thank you that we can bring to you our own unique burden of things that weigh us down because you care for us. We give them to you into your big hands and ask that you give us peace instead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Queen Chapel's online service once again. And uh, today I am joined by Craig and Georgie, who are working in Ross at Y Community Church, um, which some of you might know previously as Henry Street, but the name has now changed. Um, and it's changed because uh, counties uh, got involved, a lot of you know, um, and Martin and Tim were, were involved in that. And, and now Craig and Georgie have stepped in there and are doing some great work there. Um, but we'll hear about that in a minute. First of all, I'm going to make them feel very uncomfortable and put them under serious pressure here with a competition. Um, if you've ever been to one of our morning services in person and there's been somebody new there, you'll know that we like to do a 10 second question challenge. So we've got a bit of competition here between these two. I'm going to ask 
uh, Craig 10 questions, or, or he's got 10 seconds to answer as many of the 10 questions as possible. Um, and then Georgie has the same, and we'll see uh, how far they get down. So you ready for this, Craig? Go for it. Yep. Great. I've got my timer here, and it will play as a nice little tune when it's uh, 10 seconds or up. Great. Okay. You ready? Yes. Yep. <laughs> okay. What's your name? Craig. How long have you lived in England? Uh, 15 years. What is the capital of Scotland? Edinburgh. Not good. Oh, that was that quick 10 seconds. Goodness wow. me. Goodness me. Three. Will we try another 10? With me? Yeah, we'll go for another 10, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, 10 seconds goes very fast. Um, great. Uh, go. Uh, best uh, place you've been on holiday? Cork City in Ireland. How many kids do you have? Two. When is your anniversary? Two <laughs> <laughs> for the bell. Number <laughs> the seventeenth. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you know it's, it's Emily's birthday uh, next week, and I always get confused when when we, I first did our car insurance. I the ninth and she's her birthday is the 10th and now every time i think about it i think i can't remember which one's wrong because <laughs> i got it wrong yeah. <laughs> yeah. very good brian are you ready georgie yeah i've changed this to 20 seconds so we don't have to do two lots of 10. Okay. okay where were you born kettering what is the national animal of england lion yeah. Uh, when did you move to Ross? Uh, December. What's your favourite song? Uh, Oceans. Okay. Capital of Northern Ireland. Um, Belfast. Belfast, brilliant. So I can officially say that Craig won that one with six to five. Thank you. <laughs> well done. One for the, one for the Celts. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Great. So, um, yeah, now that the, that silliness is out of the way, um, would you guys just mind to tell us a little bit about yourselves? I mean, Craig, you've obviously got a different accent to um, most people in this part of the world. And uh, yeah, take it away. So we are Craig and Georgie Dowling. And um, Craig's originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland. And I grew up in Bedford. Um, and we have two children, Noah and Bethany. Noah is seven and Bethany is three, and um, we're just having an adventure now in Herefordshire, and it's amazing to see all that God is doing through us and helping us and guiding us to live for him. Yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, you're, you're involved in uh, what was Henry Street, now Why Community Church in, mm -hmm. uh, in Ross. Um, why Ross and why? Why, why are there? What, What's your involvement in all of that? Well, I must admit that two, three years ago, I didn't even know Ross on Why existed. Uh, we were living in Bath City, and I was working for a little independent church, and we began to get involved with counties and met Martin Irwin and others, and following the the leading that god had always brought us on church planting and reviving churches was always our thing so when we started to come into the circle of counties uh churches which were popping up like henry street which were looking for revival looking for new first life it, it clicked with everything we're about and everything we've been trained to do and who we are so we were encouraged to go and visit Ross and Y to, to preach at the church, meet the people, and to cut a long story short, after a few months of doing exactly just that, and lots of prayer, we knew it was what God had trained us to do, to come and replant and pastor this dying church. So that's how we ended up coming. Yeah, great. And you're enjoying being in Ross and being in the countryside now that you moved out of the big smoke? <laughs> we, we, we do. We, we started married life in, in London 
uh, not too far from the OT Arena. So this is really, really different. Yeah. And, uh, but we, we love it. And especially during lockdown, living in, on a farm has been brilliant. Yeah, yeah, it's really amazing. And um, yeah, and so you've um, been involved with Ross for over Six a year? Months. Uh, uh, well, we've been Sorry. visiting them for about a year or so now, but right. we, we officially started uh, six months ago. Six months. Right, okay. Yeah, right, great. Okay. And um, I can remember when we met at County's conference, um, uh, I don't know when that was, it seems like a lifetime ago now, pre-lockdown, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> February, yeah. And, uh, yeah. and I can remember you mentioning that you had kind of this, like, this really clear... Um, sort of vision for for uh, why community church being uh, a r real place of community in the town where you know it's next to Sainsbury's and people you know workers and people visiting Sainsbury's could come in and people from the street a really welcoming um, environment which is fantastic and I think um, how is how has lockdown affected that has I, I'm assuming you're not able to open and you're not able to do that kind of stuff and um, yeah I imagine that's quite frustrating for you guys Yes, it, um, it has been a little frustrating. When it first started, um, it, it knocked us for six, really. You know, we had been uh, getting into this church replant for, for a few months, and then it was all closed up. And we wondered what the way ahead would be, how we would make it work. Over the last lot of weeks, God has really pulled us together and showing us that what he's doing with us as a church during lockdown is, is reviving the people, is, is refreshing us up for a brand new season. So what we have now encouraged the whole fellowship to do is to research where they are with God, get fresh with God, so that when we do open back up, we're ready for a brand new season of a brand new church so, so in a nutshell, we, we've taken the negative of this and turned it very, very positive into letting God change his fixes and get us ready for a new season ahead. Yeah, brilliant. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely, completely. And I think we're, we're experiencing something similar in that, like you say, church is now not about a building at all, really. It's all about community and people and our relationship with God, isn't it? And that's Absolutely. Yeah, yes. a really fantastic thing from this. Yeah, I'm very aware that the church began in people's homes in the first century. Yeah. And, and here we are again in our homes on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Um, and so you guys, you know, it's really good to hear about uh, why community church and all those things. But what about you guys? What are your kind of passions and hobbies and, and what kind of makes you guys tick? Um, so I love singing um, at home, but also at church. So... Um, doing lots of worship and um, being able to praise God is one of my favourite things to do. So um, just spending more time doing that has just been brilliant. Um, but I love to crochet and to read, um, read the Bible, but also read um, novels and all sorts of stuff. Um, just to, um, we've, especially in lockdown, we've spent um, most afternoons playing football with the kids so we have like a football game mm. in the afternoon yeah, which has been absolutely brilliant <laughs> not only is our son way better at football than us <laughs> but it's just been really great to have that special time in the afternoon so yeah, yeah great. Great. The, the football has been so much fun and it's got me a lot lot more interested in, in, in football and um, so that's become quite a quite a passion um, I love reading as well, and I love walking. I love hitting the mountains and um, doing a good bit of hill walking and, and all such stuff. And uh, well, I kind of like to play golf, but it doesn't happen so much these days. Does it? Right. Yeah, no, I didn't know. Like, I, I had a, my first game of golf in about six years two weeks ago. Oh, that's very uh, good. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> yes. I, uh, yeah, it was it was my. Uh, my bag was a little bit lighter by the end with the number of balls that I'd lost, but you know, <laughs> I had to go. I'll go right. find more for you. Yeah, but is there anything that we as a church, because we, over the years, people from our church have been involved in uh, sometimes quite intensely and sometimes from 
from a distance in uh, what was Henry Street, um, they would notice Henry Street, but now the wide community church. And um, what can we pray for you guys and pray for the church over the next uh, coming weeks and months? Sure. I uh, would like to say a big, big thank you to everyone at Glebe Chapel for the years gone by of, of support uh, within the little church. And thank you for the continued support going forward. Uh, church planting jobs like Y Community Church are always dependent on God's people around us getting involved, supporting us and doing exactly what Glebe Chapel is doing. So thank you. And as you pray for us, do you pray particularly for our relaunch? That was due to happen probably early summer. It will not happen early summer now. We are keen to work towards when the actual relaunch of the church would happen. We would like it to be a, a bit of a special mission weekend. And uh, we would like prayer to go into wisdom and guidance for how and when that should happen down the line. Obviously, keep praying for us at the moment as we keep the little fellowship together via Zoom or Facebook week by week uh, for midweek breaking of the bread, prayer meetings, devotionals, and the Sunday service. The big thing of the Sunday service is that we're aiming to reach brand new people who don't know about the church, who don't know the gospel even. So pray that we're actually reaching uh, new people who, who can hear the gospel for the first time even. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I'll just pray for you guys and then um, let you get back to your kids and uh, your work at home. Um, thank you. Brilliant. Father God, we thank you for uh, your church. We thank you that we are uh, not constrained to a building, that you are with us wherever we are, that your spirit uh, lives within us and that we have uh, a direct line to the Father through Jesus. So, Father God, we pray for... Uh, Craig and Georgie, Lord. We ask that you would bless them. We ask that you would uh, build them up, Lord. We uh, Church revitalization, church planting is uh, not an easy thing to do, Lord. So we ask that you would strengthen them and support them, uh, that they would know your blessing and know your peace uh, and on the call in their lives. Um, Father God, we uh, thank you that you've brought them to this area, that you've uh, guided them to come to Ross and Why, even though they didn't know what it was or where it was and so father god through your guidance and through your uh, through your love and your grace we ask that you would um, give them wisdom give them enthusiasm give them um, a real sense of of your spirit being with them as they uh, look to relaunch the church whenever that is and father god we just ask that all the people that come through the doors of Y community church as they hear your word hear the gospel, and we cling to the promise that in, in your scripture that the word of God will not return in vain. So Lord, as this, uh, this family preach the word of God and how they uh, live and, and how they are in church and also through uh, what they say at church, Lord, we ask that um, that promise become true, that your word would not return in vain. And so Father God, we ask that you would bless them. We ask that you'd bless Y Community Church. And uh, Lord, we pray for uh, the people in their congregation who were online things and Zoom are new and slightly daunting. Father, we ask that you would give them uh, a real sense of your presence and your spirit, um, even though it feels a bit strange talking to a, a computer screen or hearing from a computer screen. Uh, but Father God, we pray that you would bless them and be with them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.
it's really hard to reconstruct the life of someone who lived hundreds of years ago. And that is certainly the case with the biblical characters. Usually we know far less about the person than we'd like to. One example of this is Mark. There are some things we do know. His mother was called Mary. Barnabas was his cousin. He very likely grew up in Jerusalem. And there was a meeting of the early church at his mother's house. That's the house Peter went to after he was miraculously released from prison in Acts chapter 12. When he knocked on the door and the people who were there didn't even seem to believe that he could have been released. Mark might even have been in Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. His gospel describes a young man who revealed quite a lot more of himself than he had intended when he fled from the scene. If that sounds a bit cryptic, then have a look at Mark chapter 14, verses 51 and 52 when this is finished. We also know that Paul and Barnabas took Mark with them on their first missionary journey, but Acts tells us that Mark left them fairly early on. We don't know why. They were going through a part of modern Turkey that at that time was known for disease and bandits, so maybe it just got a bit too hard and Mark was homesick for the big city of Jerusalem. We also know that Mark was indirectly responsible for the breakup of the Paul and Barnabas missionary team. Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them on their second missionary journey, but Paul certainly did not. And so Mark's early appearances in the Bible really aren't high points in his life at all. There are some pretty humiliating examples of Mark messing things up, either directly or indirectly. So how do you come back from that? What do you do next? That we might like to know, but sadly we don't. What we do know is that with God, no cause is ever hopeless, and God can use anyone. And that certainly was the case with Mark. In Colossians chapter 4, Mark is called by Paul a fellow worker and a comfort. In 2 Timothy, Paul calls him useful in ministry. And then in Peter's first letter, Peter calls him my son. And it's that relationship with Peter which is really interesting for us now. Because there's a tradition which goes all the way back to the early church, which is that when Mark wrote his gospel, he was telling Peter's point of view. Even though Mark might have been uh, an eyewitness to some of the events that took place in Jerusalem or when Jesus was on earth uh, in that area, Mark's main source of information seems to have been Peter himself, one of the three apostles closest to Jesus. Now, having said that, there's something which might come as a bit of a surprise. Even though this is Peter's angle on events, Mark seems to have written for Gentiles and not for Jews. As you go through your study of Mark, you'll find that there aren't any quotes from the Old Testament at all. And there are times when Mark breaks off from the story to translate words or to explain some of the Jewish customs. Mark seems to assume that his original readers will not be able to speak Hebrew or Aramaic and won't know the normal practices of the Jews in Israel, all things which actually help us today. When Pam and I first moved to Peru, we spent eight months at language school in the south of the country. We were slogging through Spanish grammar and trying to wrap our heads around a new language. And one of the challenges that we had, because of the reason we were in Peru in the first place, was that we had to try and get to grips with the Bible in a new language too. And I thought that one thing I should start trying to do is read the Bible in Spanish. I decided that I would start with short books, but that wasn't necessarily the best idea. I quickly found that reading Jude, which is hard enough in your first language, is really not any easier when you try and do it in a language that you can't speak. And in the end, I settled on Mark's gospel. Now, strangely, a few years later, I got chatting to someone who worked in the east of Peru in the jungle with new tribes. His role was reaching unreached people groups out in the deep jungle. And he told me that for them, Mark is often one of the first books of the Bible they translate for these new tribes. And both my experience and his came down to the same reason. It's all to do with the style of Mark when compared to the others. Once this video is over, if you grab your Bible, have a flip through the first chapter of each of the four Gospels, and you'll see what I mean. John, he kicks off with some rich and deep and famous theology. Matthew hits you with a genealogy and Jesus' family tree right from the first verse. Luke really takes his time. A long first chapter includes the foretelling of John the Baptist's birth, the foretelling of Jesus' birth, Mary's song, the birth of John the Baptist. You reach the end of Luke chapter 1 and Jesus is not even born yet. Mark is completely the opposite. Just in Mark chapter 1, Jesus has been baptised, faced temptation in the wilderness, begun preaching, called the first apostles, cast out a demon, 
helped Peter's mother-in-law, cleansed a leper, and done so many incredible things that his fame has spread through the whole region of Galilee. In Mark, Jesus does not hang about. And this is what you'll find as you work through the book. Lots of short, quick stories. Jesus is preaching, and he's teaching, and he's healing, and he's feeding. There is always something happening. There are times when Mark doesn't even bother to tell you that Jesus has moved from one place to another. He just changes the scene and waits for you to catch up as you go along. You'll also find that when Mark tells a story, especially when you compare him to Matthew or Luke, he often has more details than they do, but he adds fewer comments to explain what's taking place. Mark is content just to tell you what happens and let the events speak for themselves. Now, Saying that Mark likes a lot of short, quick-fire stories does not mean there's no broader structure to the Gospel. There certainly is. The first half of the book is taken up with events in Galilee, all the way through to the middle of chapter 8. The rest of chapter 8, then chapters 9 and 10, see Jesus and the Apostles making their way through to Jerusalem. Then most of the rest of the book is taken up with the last week of Jesus' life, including the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection. But if you want a really simple structure, you can pretty much break the book in half using a few verses in the middle of chapter 8 as a centrepiece. Mark chapter 8 and verses 27 to 30 say this, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now up to this point in Mark chapter 8, Jesus does miracles and he heals and he feeds and he casts out demons and does all kinds of amazing things. And his power and his divine energy are seen in miracles and teaching and preaching. And through all this, he is leading the apostles on a journey, at the end of which Peter openly states their belief that Jesus is the Messiah. And you think, they've got it. But have they really? They might know that Jesus is the Messiah, but they still don't really understand what this means. And after this passage, the tone of the book starts to change. There are only going to be a handful more miracles now before the miracle of the resurrection. And one of those miracles is the cursing of the fig tree, a destructive miracle that seems to raise as many questions as anything. Instead, Jesus starts to talk about his suffering and his death. He's no longer the miracle worker surrounded by crowds. He's humble and rejected. And I think Mark wants you to remember this doesn't mean his power has been limited. It's just a different expression of his power. And Mark starts to show what he really wants. What is Mark's purpose? It's not so much that you know about Jesus and the events that took place. Mark wants you to know Jesus himself. Mark's focus is, who is Jesus? And then how do you respond to that answer? So Mark makes some interesting choices about things he includes and doesn't include in his gospel. As you start your study in the next few weeks, you'll quickly see there's nothing about Jesus' birth in the Gospel. And as you finish up, you'll see there's very little about the events after the resurrection. Instead, Mark dedicates almost half his book to just the last few weeks of Jesus' life. So what is Mark's answer to that question? Who is Jesus? Well, there are lots of layers to that all the way through his Gospel. But does, Mark does show his hand at key points in Jesus' life. Mark starts off his gospel with these words, that this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And that statement, that idea that Jesus is the Son of God, crops up at most of the key points in his life. At Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration, at the cross, each time you see that affirmation, Jesus is the Son of God. The demons recognise it. Even the high priest at Jesus' trial asks him, are you the Son of God? To which Jesus agrees. And that maybe leads us to one of the last things I want to say about Mark's Gospel. One last thing to look out for as you go through this series of studies. You see, there's something that Mark loves to do as he writes. He wants to surprise you. And Mark's Gospel is full of unexpected twists and turns. He tells you all through his Gospel that Jesus is the Son of God. 
But then when he describes Jesus, he tells you about moments when Jesus is sad or moved with emotion or amazed or tired or indignant or angry. So Jesus is the son of God, yet he's got all these human emotions. What do you make of that? Jesus does miracles and restores the outcast to society. But as a result, Jesus becomes an outcast himself. Jesus touches lepers. And instead of Jesus becoming unclean or contaminated, it's Jesus that contaminates the leper with his purity and cleanness. And listen out especially for what people had to say uh, to and about Jesus. You often find that those who are closest to him, like the disciples, or even his own family, are those who are slowest to understand. Whereas other people meet him for the first time and come up with statements of such deep truth you can't help but be impressed. People like blind Bartimaeus or the Roman centurion at the cross. And so much is the contrast that you start to wonder who the blind one is. Is it Bartimaeus or is it the apostles? And maybe Mark is trying to teach us something important about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Sometimes being a disciple could be a, an appealing thing, like in the first half of the book when there are miracles and healings and food to spare. But what about in the second part of the gospel when the focus is suffering and humility? What do you do as a disciple when your own life is marked by moments when it all seems to go wrong, like the first part of Mark's life was? And what do you, what do, you do as a disciple when there are times when you just don't understand what's happening, which seems to be the case for the apostles most of the way through Mark? And I think the Gospel of Mark, for Mark in his Gospel and in his own life, following Jesus is the key. Maybe that's even more important than understanding everything or getting everything right or doing everything well. Frequently in Mark's Gospel, the Twelve do not understand, but that does not stop them being disciples. For Jesus, true understanding only comes in the cross, and the task of a disciple is to persevere with him, and to keep with him and to learn and to obey. The same can be true for us at times. We don't understand the things that Jesus brings into our life, but Jesus asks us to have confidence that he knows what he is doing and to remember that being confused isn't incompatible with being a disciple. Not understanding isn't the mark of a bad disciple. In fact, at times, being confused is what characterizes those who are closest to Jesus. So may God bless you and encourage you and enrich you as you study the Gospel of Mark over the coming weeks. Amen. Hi everyone, let's sing together Reckless Love.
Don't deserve it Still you give